Well, Congress enacted Mother's Day in 1913, but motherhood was established by God long before that as a part of his perfect plan for humanity. Uh, motherhood was not uh, an afterthought, but it was a divine intention from the beginning. From the very beginning of creation, God had moms in mind. In the Old Testament, we read about the, the uh, command to honor your father and your mother. In Ephesians chapter 6, you can turn there, page 829. Just a very brief, a brief passage this morning. And it's really to the children more than the, the adults. But if you have a mom, that puts you in one that you still need to be listening to this thing. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. We join today in a centuries old tradition of honoring our, our moms. The weary mother uh, tucked her children into bed and then returned into the den to relax. And her heart fell when she saw on the floor all these little pieces of paper they'd gotten into the encyclopedias. And a page had been torn from the encyclopedia. And so little scattered little pieces were scattered all across the floor. Uh, despite her frustration, she gathered the pieces and started taping them back into the encyclopedia. It was the face of a child. And when she had finished, she turned the page to see that it was a map of the world on the other side. And it made her think, she says, I guess this is what this is all about. That as I shape the lives of my children, I'm shaping the world. And that's impact that mothers have on their children and on society. Our society, of course, uh, has forgotten the value of mothering. Uh, they think it's a joke. The academia and the business world, Hollywood, make it uh, a, a foolish, stupid thing. They laugh at you. They denigrate anybody who's a stay-at-home mom. And they, they do not appreciate the importance or the value that mothers have to a society. It's of eternal significance to each child uh, and to the world. And so today we, we've gathered to honor our mothers, to recognize the value and the significance and, and, and the worth that mothers have. So first of all, we want to say honor your mother. Honor your mother because she has needs. Mothers need to be affirmed and appreciated. It's possible to become so immersed in diapers and dishes and debts that at the moment, uh, that moment, the, she needs a significant person, somebody to come in and remind her of the value of what she's doing. Sometimes you wonder what is, you know, after the thousandth diaper and after the thousandth load of laundry, what, what's going on here? Uh, and so in our society where motherhood, the, the stay-at-home mom is so put down, I'm reminded of a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania. He was attending a gathering uh, with, uh, there at the faculty gathering, and they were allowed to bring their spouses with them. And so always at these types of things, one of the other lawyers or sociologists, one of the women would come up to his wife and they would say, and, and what is it that you do, my dear? And so she had an answer prepared for him. And she would say, I am socializing two homo sapiens, homo sapiens into the dominant values of Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be instruments for transformation of the social order into a teleologically prescribed utopia inherent in the eschaton. And follow that up with, and what is it that you do? And then when they say a lawyer or a sociologist, it doesn't seem so over, overpowering. Mothers need to be reminded that they are somebody and that they're doing something significant. 
on the other hand, there's there's this pressure from the opposite side pushing the other way to be a, a super mom. That you can have it all. That you can have a perfect hair day. You can have a career. You can have a family. You can run marathons. You can make perfect biscuits. That you can do all this stuff. That your clothes come out perfectly right. You can do all this stuff. You can't. Something's got to give. You can't have it all. You can't do it all. Don't buy that lie. And you moms, relax a little bit. You, you, you can't do all this stuff. It's interesting now that Sarah's retired and a stay-at-home mom like her mom, she's now cleaning around the house like her mom did as a stay-at-home mom. But when she was working, something has to give, you know. And so... Uh, don't, don't, don't fall to this pressure to do all the things. You've got to, you got to pick and choose some of the things that are, that are important. Uh, you, you frequently feel the pressure to be all things to all people at all times. And I think that's probably the, the female makeup that's just part of being a mom, uh, that, that gets to you. And we all have opinions as to what moms should do. Society collects all these ideas and they put them in together and we get this ideal motherhood, this ideal picture of what it's supposed to be. And, and this pressure builds up. But what, what makes a good mom anyway? Uh, does, she does everything exactly right. She produces good kids. What? Here, here's some common assumptions about a good mom. I found this the other day, and I thought this was good. She never bakes biscuits from little cardboard tubes that go pow. She apparently, uh, she appears instantly whenever any member yells, Mom, Mom. Susan Dittman, a friend of ours in Virginia, years ago called us and said, Man, I'm just a mere mom. My kind of Sarah was little, her, their daughter was little. She says, Mere mom, mere. Mere mom. She says, I'm just a mere mom now. And, uh, and that's how it goes. She knows exactly what garment each child wants to wear to school each day and has it washed, mended, and hung in the closet. She's always home when you call. She uses coupons to save a minimum of $15 on each visit to the grocery store. She never raises her voice. Never dreads teacher conferences. Attends every t-ball and soccer game in hose and heels, fresh from the office, of course. Or some world-expanding uh, uh, venture. Never leaves the kids with runny noses in the church nursery. Never says no to the PTA. Keeps a regimented family schedule of daily tooth flossing and Bible memorization. And on and on and on the list goes. There's some other myths about motherhood. Mothering is easy. Mothering is natural. Mothering is always fun. Those are myths, right? I thought here's some amens out there on some of this stuff. Those are myths. There's nothing easy about good mothering. It can be backbreaking. It can be heart wrenching and anxiety producing, and that's just the morning. Give women per permission to to mother their way. Receive them a, a, a task, you know, relieve them of that task of being a super mom. Allow your mom to be who she is, human, limited, sinful, moody, not perfect. Accept her for who she is. Don't put a lot of pressures on her, knowing that, that she's warm and kind and always loving towards you. We honor mothers, not because... They're perfect, but because God has first loved you, honored you, and blessed you. And so we too today honor mothers. And then we honor, you, uh, we honor your mother here. The second thing is because she has gifts to give. Many, many gifts that she gives. One of the gifts is to be a model. Mothers are a model. She models for her children what it means to be feminine to be a wife, to be a mother. And, and she models values and 
attitudes and behaviors. They, they get this from you, Mom. Uh, so many of the people that we know in history, uh, children reflect the quality of, of the mother. Let me just give you a couple names. Sir Walter Scott's mother was a very superior woman, well-educated, and a great lover of poetry and painting. Byron's mother was proud, ill-tempered, and violent. Byron became a drunk, a capable poet with a profligate life. I didn't say profitable life, profligate, profligate, I get it right, a dissipated life. The mother of Napoleon Bonaparte was noted for her beauty and energy. Her son became a great Frenchman and soldier. Lord Bacon's mother was a woman of superior mind and deep piety. The mother of Nero was a murderess. The son became one, although he was an emperor. The mother of Washington was pious, pure, and true. The mother of Patrick Henry was marked by her superior conversational powers. And the mother of John Wesley was remarkable for uh, her intelligence, piety, and executive ability. I mean, she had 19 children. Uh, she was called the mother of Methodis Methodism. So in each of these, the son inherited the prominent traits of the mom. And most importantly, a mother models what it means uh, for Christ to be the Lord of your life. Mother, you need to model that for your kids. You need to be uh, show them that the Lord means something to your life. That he's important to you. Mothers give the gift of nurturing. She provides a specific information, uh, an affirmation of love. And this gives a child security. Children feel secure when they know that their mom loves them and is there, always got their back. Nurturing includes setting limits. It's disciplining. It's giving forgiveness. It's all also showing warmth and affection. One man put it this way. He said, when I was a little boy, my mother used to bid me kneel beside her and placed her hand upon my head while she prayed. Before I was old enough to know her, uh, her worth, she died. I was left to my own guidance. Like others, I was inclined to evil passions, but often felt myself checked as if drawn back by a soft hand upon my head. When a young man, when a young man, I traveled in foreign lands and was exposed to many temptations. But when I would have yielded, that same hand was upon my head. I seemed to feel its pressure, as in the days of my happy infancy. And sometimes there came with it a solemn voice saying, Do not, do not, do not this great wickedness, my son, nor sin against God. There's that influence, this impact that you have, Mom, long after. Uh, you may be gone. My, my mom passed away four years ago now. And at our house, especially when the kids were, were in our house, Cynthia and the grandkids or other people are in our house, our company, they always leave the closet doors open. And I always go to their rooms and shut the closet door. Why? My mom told me you don't air condition the closet door, the closets. You shut the doors. All these years later, I go around and I shut the closet doors. We do get it after a while, Mom. I remember I was going out. I was 22 years old. I was going out. I was at junior college. I was going out for the evening. And Mom said, you know, it's turning cool out there. You might want a jacket or sweater. And I stopped. And I thought, she might be right. <laughs> that was the first time <laughs> that I did that. <laughs> yeah, it took it me till me I was 22 before I realized that she she's learned some things while I'm at college. But nurture creates a climate, and it prepares for Christ to enter in as that that child matures. I learned so much from my mother and my dad. Uh, just by watching at home, uh, listening, watching how they responded to, you know, problems in life or this and that in life. And, 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 and I remember the, the little 
music box that we had. And we, you know, of course, we sang Davy Crockett and she'd be coming around the mountain and all those songs. But we also sang all the Sunday school songs that they taught us. I mean, these are the things that, that we learn from, from mom and dad. And it's, it's really important, uh, this nurturing that, that you give. It does come out later on. So be aware of those that, that were good, had good moms. Man, you want to be a good mom because that dominant trait of yours is going to come out in those kids of yours. And then honor your mother because she has choices to make and hard choices, tough decisions. For me, growing up, you know, for me as a parent, when we had the boys at home, we never seemed to make the right choice. You know, the times that we were supposed to take them to the emergency room, we didn't. We probably should have. The time we did take them to the emergency room, we didn't need to. It never seemed to get that stuff right. Uh, but it's tough when you're, when, you're, when you're a parent. And a mother makes a lot of vo- uh, value uh, choices, choices that affect values. I look at our world today. I look at our moms today out there. And I'm wondering what in the world is going on. I mean, the values that they are passing on to their children, the values that these women are choosing are destroying their children. They're destroying their families. Uh, Their choices are are jeopardizing the very foundation of what they want to be doing with their lives. Uh, I see these gals who have two, three, four, five children, and they're in the bars till two at night. Um, I just don't get it. Girls just want to party. Okay, I get it. Okay, you want to party. Come on. But you're a mom. You're a mom. You got kids at home. Kids depending on you. Kids watching you. I just, I don't get it. But choices about material goods, social status, moral issues. Such choices influence your children. A teacher put a question to my mother one time. They were in arithmetic class. And the teacher said, Gene, your mother made a peach pie. There were ten of you at the table. Your mother, your father, and eight children. How much of the pie would you get? A ninth, ma'am, my mom said. No, Gene. Now pay attention. There are ten of you. Ten, remember? Don't you know your fractions? Yes, ma'am. I know my fractions. But I also know my mom. And she'd say, I don't want any pie. Sacrifice. Laying it down. That's what mothers do. If you're going to be a mom... You need to, well, from that day forward, if you decide to be a mom, you have no life from that day forward, okay? You now live for those kids. And you're going to sacrifice for those kids. You're going to lay your life down for those kids. And if you're not going to do that, don't become a mom. Because that's what it takes. It's hard. It takes a real commitment. The most important choice is, Who is the Lord of your life? You cannot give your children anything more significant or valuable or powerful or long-lasting as your personal choice, as Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. It's the most important thing that you can pass on to your children. Tell your children about Jesus. Say their prayers every night. Read to them about Deborah and Gideon and Martha and Mary and John. Read to them about the Bible characters. Pray with them. Be there with them. Take take them to church. I admire you women who come without your husbands, who still come to church, even if the old man's too lazy not to come. Even if he made it today on Mother's Day, I'll just move on and be nice. But 
teach those kids. Give them some foundation. If you don't tell them about God, don't be one of those moms who says, well, I'm just going to let them make their own decision. I'm going to let them grow up and decide. Well, all they know about is hell. All they know about is immorality. All they know is about the things of the world. How can your child choose for God if all they know are the things of the world? Who's going to introduce them to, to, to righteousness? Who's going to introduce them to integrity? Who's going to teach them about honesty if you don't do it? The world is not going to do it. So give them a chance. You have to talk to them about God because nobody else is going to. Get in there and, and give your child half a chance to make a good, good choice. A woman was visiting one of her friends one day and she was watching the kids playing around her and she said, oh, I would give my life to have two children like that. And the mother, with kind of subdued earnestness, said, that's, that's what it takes. You give your life. And mothers do that. They pour themselves out for the kids. They lay their lives down. When they're tired, when they're sick, when they're overworked, when they're over pressured, this, this, they perform time and time again. A mother chooses her role under the lordship of Christ. And then one other gift. Mothers are invited here. Today we want to invite you as a mom to let grace enter into your life. Invite God if you haven't done that. You need the power, the grace, and the mercy of God in your life if you're going to be a mom. The psychological makeup of a woman and as a mom, you need God's help to keep you together. The pressures that come on you, the pressures that you put up on yourself demand God's enabling. You need his presence. You need his wisdom. You need his comfort. You need his guidance in your life. You just have to have that. So turn to him. If you've not done that, ask him to be the Lord of your life, to, to set the pattern. I'm just waiting on a sneeze. Sorry. But mothers, we, we honor you today, not because you're perfect, but we honor you because God first loved you. Last is you. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. I'm sorry. Because of what God's done for you in Christ, you're invited to choose him as the Lord of your life. The demands that are placed upon you as a mom demand that you have Christ in your life because he's the only one that can help you meet these demands that are placed on you as a mother. God wants you to give, he wants to give you the gift of abundant life. And with that come special gifts of love and patience and, and strength and mercy and kindness that as it flows from him, it flows through you to your family. So choose him. Look to him. That's your choice. But if you're a mom, please, please look to the Lord as your Lord and Savior. This morning we'd like to honor our moms. What our mothers, those of you that are mothers, would you, would you please stand at this time? Let's pray. Yeah, let's give him a hand. Give him a hand. Let's pray. Grace is God. Especially this day, we thank you for the women in our lives. Our mothers, grandmothers, godmothers, aunts. For all the women in our lives who have nurtured us and loved us, strengthened us and sustained us. For the women we name in our hearts, we thank you. We thank you for their sacrifices of time personal freedoms. We're grateful for the sleepless nights that they endured on our behalf and for their caring compassion in times of illness or sorrow. 
We thank you for their discipline, for the correction that helped mold our character, teach us respect and manners, and instill in us godly values. We ask you to bless our mothers, to pour out your spirit of grace upon them, to grant them the strength and peace for those for whom Mother's Day renews feelings of sorrow and grief over what never was or might have been. We ask for comfort for those who experience the pain of neglect or abuse. Pray for healing and the grace to forgive. We thank you that you are present to each of us, whether our mothers are near or far, present or gone, and that in you we can find the perfect love and acceptance that we so deeply desire. In Jesus' name, amen.